All right, uh, we you will open up to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. So last week we started to look at Acts chapter 7. We did part 1 of a lesson in history. Today we're going to be doing part 2. Acts chapter 7, verses 37 through 53. As you're turning there, I'll share a story with you. Two pals are sitting in a pub watching the 11 o'clock news. A report comes on about a man threatening to jump from a 20th floor on a downtown building. One friend turns to the other and says, I'll bet you 10 bucks the guy doesn't jump. It's a bet, agrees his buddy. A few minutes later, the man on the ledge jumps. So the loser hands his pal a $10 bill. I can't take your money, his friend admits. I saw him jump earlier on the six o'clock news. <laughs> Me too, says the other buddy. I just didn't think he'd jump again. <laughs> so how well do you pick up on things? Some people are pretty oblivious in life. Some of us are like that fellow and we cannot see what's going on right in front of us. God has shown us what has happened to prepare us for what will happen. We have some awesome history preserved for us in the Old Testament. And last week we started to look at Stephen's address to the high priest and to the council. Stephen gives an account of the history of Israel as a defense for why he's standing before them. They've accused him of things. They brought up these false accusations. They've, they've trumped up these charges against Stephen, this man who was full of faith, full of grace, one of the first ones chosen by the church for service, and what many of us consider the first deacons. So Stephen now has a giant target on his back. Satan has decided to go after him. And these people are mounting these accusations. So now Stephen has the opportunity to defend himself. So how does he decide to defend himself? He doesn't say, well, it wasn't my fault, or he doesn't plead insanity. He doesn't do any of these classic defenses that many of us have seen over the course of time. His defense revolves all around the history of Israel. And so last week we started to look at this. Part one, a history of Israel. This lesson in history. So Stephen now, as we continue this, part two, Stephen is giving an account of Israel for his defense. Are you picking up any of the things that he's putting down? He's been telling us about some stuff we looked at last week. Stephen is giving us a lot of information. He's going through thousands of years, centuries of time of the history of Israel, and he's going real quick almost as fast as I would. Are you tracking with any of it? Are you learning from any of it? Would you be able to retell any of this information if an opportunity presented itself to you? And do you know where Stephen is going with all of this? It's very interesting to me that this guy who's been accused of all this stuff decides to use the history of Israel as his defense. And as we get closer and closer to the end, it becomes more and more obvious why he decided to go this route. There were six elements to this defense that God wants you to see. I want you to see this historical defense given by Stephen told you last week there were six elements to this defense. We looked at three of them. The first three last week, verses one through eight, the first element of his defense was promise. If you have your notes, this is probably already got this written down. The first element of his defense was verses one through eight, promise. Verses nine through 16, prosperity. And then verses 17 through 36, provision. Did all of my good Bible students read the next section and figure out what the next three elements of this defense was. I gave you a hint. They start with the letter P. Nobody? Well, here we go. Here's the answers. The fourth element in his defense, verses 37 through 43, is problems. 
You know, those first three elements were really nice. Things seemed really good. We got Moses on the scene. Everybody seems to like Moses. Okay, okay, we can do this. But you know what ends up ultimately happening when things look good? We end up with problems. Fifth element to this defense, verses 44 through 50, is priority. As we downgrade with problems, we lose sight of the priority. Then finally, the sixth element of this defense, verses 51 through 53, is persecution. This is what Stephen tells us about. So, let's dive in, verses 37 through 43. Let's start to look at some of the problems that are going to pop up as we mosey through a history of Israel. Verse 37. I'm going to read verses 37 through 43. Tell me if you can figure out what the problems are that arise. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, sacrificed, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away to Babylon. What are the problems that pop up? We've had such wonderful times. We've been given this promise. Things have been going so good, and Moses is on the scene. How could you go wrong with Moses? Well, we have some problems now, don't we? There are some issues that come up. Just when you think life is going well, there's going to be some problems. Moses said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. He's talking about Jesus. In one of the early prophesy, prophecies of Jesus, he's coming. You think everything should be okay. We're on track here, right? right. Wrong. Because <laughs> guess what happens? Moses is going to go up on the Mount Sinai. He's going to receive the Ten Commandments. We've read this story. This is a very familiar story for us. He goes up on Mount Sinai. He's going to get the tablets, the Ten Commandments. Things are going great. But you know what? He's up there a long time. And the children of Israel are waiting. Where's Moses? Is Moses coming back? What happened to Moses? Have you seen Moses? I haven't seen Moses. Have you seen Moses? I haven't seen Moses. Is Moses ever going to come back? Did Moses leave us? Did Moses leave us hanging? He left us hanging. Ugh, what are we going to do with this guy now? Aaron, you're Moses' brother, right? You were with Pharaoh. You did some neat stuff. I got an idea, says the children of Israel. Here's my idea. Let's give Aaron all of our gold. And we're going to have Aaron melt it down and we're going to make ourselves a golden calf. And that we will worship instead. We want to go back to Egypt anyway. You know, we actually had food to eat when we were there. Life was a little better there, wasn't it? How could, by the way, how could they forget how awful it was in Egypt? It hasn't really been that long. But we as people are very prone to forget the bondage from which we came. And the people just wanted to go back to that bondage. They wanted to be back in Egypt. They were tired of waiting for Moses. They were tired of waiting for what he was going to bring to them. And they decided that they were just going to go off on their own and do their own thing. I'm glad that doesn't describe anybody here. I'm glad none of us have ever acted like this, like children. Have you ever acted like this? 
You ever done this? You decide things aren't going your way. I'm tired of waiting. And so I'm just going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, how I want to do it, where I want to do it, where it's mine. I suspect that we probably are more guilty of this than we care to admit. And while this isn't confessional time in, in your own heart, on your own piece of paper, you could probably write down two or three times of when you just decided you were going to go it alone because you were either tired of waiting, you didn't like the results, you didn't have enough faith to get past what you were going through. And so you had Aaron build yourself a golden calf. Well, how'd that work out for him? Was that really, was that really the best thing that they could have done at that time? I mean, we have the benefit of hindsight. You know what they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. We can look back and we can go, wow, what a bunch of dummies. Can you believe these dummies actually built a golden calf? Can you believe how foolish these people were? How did they not know Moses was going to come back? I mean, it's real easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. Really easy to tell somebody else how they could have done their job. It's really easy to be a backseat driver. He's cute. He's fine. You know, it's real easy to call somebody out when you already know all the right answers. And that's what was going on. We have these problems. They do happen. They will rise up and things are going to go sour. Things will go south. And that's just the way it is. And that's what happened to these guys. Moses comes back down and he loses it. Guys, what is wrong with you? What's going on here? And he tells God, you know, let's just start over. Let's kill them all. Let's just start over. And God's like, no, nah, we're not doing that. But you know what? I wonder if God was displeased with them. What do you think? I don't think he was thrilled. But we have these problems. And so Stephen makes a turn in his defense here. We have all these great things. Moses is on the scene. We've got... Uh, promises given to Abraham and we got the patriarchs going on things are going great and Stephen says you know what there starts to come a time where there's a group of people that are going to go against what God is trying to do do you recognize who these people are can you spot them in your midst those that are opposed to what God wants to do where God is trying to go I told you last time that God is a God that has a, a linear line that he's following. We don't serve a God that goes in circles. We have a God that's trying to go in a straight line. He's trying to go somewhere. God has a destination in mind for all of us. God has something special in mind for all of us. He's got a straight line that he's following. He doesn't want you to repeat all your same mistakes from the past. He doesn't want people to get in your way. But there's a lot of people that want to get in the way of what God is trying to do and where God is trying to go. And these people are starting to be the seed here of we got this guy called Moses. He's trying to do something. He's trying to lead the people. He's doing what God is telling him to do. And we've got this crowd of people who are in the way. Do you think the people of Stephen's day got it? Do you think they could figure out that they were the ones that were in the way of what God was trying to do with Stephen in this time? Do you think they got it? I don't think they got it. I think they got mad, but I don't think they got it. And you know, even today, we still have people who want to get in the way of what God is trying to do. Now, it may not come across as stoning people to death. I'm not sure we see a lot of that anymore. But you know what? There's still a lot of people that want to stifle, who want to choke what God is trying to do. And it happens in a lot of different ways. Like grumbling, complaining, gossiping, laziness grumpiness 
all kinds of garbage gets in the way of what God is trying to do with his people. We got problems. Can you recognize the problems that are in your life? Can you recognize when you're getting in the way of what God is trying to do? I'm not so sure that these people that Stephen was talking to quite got it. I'm not sure that the people in the days of Moses quite got it. And I bet today is no different. Most people don't quite get when they're in the way of what God is trying to do. So when you see somebody doing what God wants them to do, you support them, you get behind them, and you work with them, not against them. God is trying to wake them up here in verses 42 and 43. And he ends with this, I don't know, I'm going to call it a threat. Can I call it a threat? He says, if you guys don't straighten up, if you, don't, if you guys don't get in line, I'm going to cart you off to Babylon and don't think that I won't do it. Oftentimes we yell at our kids, you're not getting any ice cream if you continue to do this with your sister. And you know who gets ice cream later? When they probably shouldn't be getting ice cream later. We're so, we're so empty in our threats as people. We just let things just slide. We just let things go. Our empty threats are rather meaningless most of the time, it seems to me anymore. But when God says, I'm going to send you off to Babylon if you don't straighten out, if you know your history, you know what happens. God sends them off to Babylon because they didn't straighten up. They failed to keep covenant. And he's not going to mess with them. And off to Babylon they go. Just like that. We serve a God who demands respect, obedience, these sorts of things. And they weren't willing to give it to them and off they went. As a result of their problems, as a result of their sin, they lose a sense of priority in their life. There's a little bit, but boy, they, they tend to lose sight of what's really important in life. <clears throat> Verses 44 through 50, we're going to see that they, they, start to lose a, they start to lose a little bit here. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. As he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked him to find a dwelling for God of Jacob. Uh, but Solomon built him a house. However, Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Do you truly understand the priority that God needs to have, not only in your life, but in this world? So he starts by talking about the tabernacle. Our fathers had the tabernacle of, will, of witness in the wilderness. It was a special dwelling place of God. And then it housed the Ark of the Covenant and some other things. And eventually it would turn in and flourish into the temple. And they had all this ornate stuff and the gold. And the gold was so, so plentiful in the temple that when the Romans came along in 70 AD to destroy the temple, you know, when Jesus said they're going to not one stone is going to be left, it, the reason that that happened was there's so much gold in the temple that they literally took away every stone to get to every last little bit of gold. There was just so much to get. It was worth the time. These people wanted to have these ornate temples because there was more than one temple in history, as you know. They wanted God to have this wonderful dwelling place. They wanted to use cedar from Lebanon and just have it so wonderful and ornate and big and luxurious. And they wanted it to be perfect. And while... These are good things. These are great things. There's nothing wrong with 
allowing God to have the most ornate structure in the land. What's the problem, though? If your life looks like you're swimming through sewage, I'm not so sure God cares what his house looks like. He's much more concerned about how you're living your life, how you're loving people, how you're loving him, what you're doing with yourself, and these sorts of things, much more than he cares about what his dwelling place looks like because heaven is his throne anyway. He's much more concerned about the way you're living your life and if you're living for him, do you live a transformed life? Is you know, is, are you different? Are you changed? Is the Holy Spirit really taken root in your life? Have you truly accepted? Are you born again? These sorts of things. Your life can't look like garbage and sewage and then say, oh yeah, but, but you know, I've, I've got a great dwelling place for God in my backyard. The Israelites had a wonderful temple too that Solomon had built and one day he left it. Do you know why he left it? Was it because it became less ornate? Was it because some of the gold had flaked off? Was it because it got hit by an earthquake and started to crumble? Why did God leave that temple? It was a luxurious temple. In fact, 70 years later, after the captives returned back and they start to re rebuild Zerubbabel's temple, those that had seen Solomon's temple wept. It wasn't as glorious. So why did the Spirit of God leave that glorious temple? Because the people weren't there anymore. They didn't even notice when he left. It's called Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has departed. They didn't even realize it. They never noticed it. Didn't even register with them that God had left their temple. But we're all worried about having a great looking temple, aren't we guys? Woo! Great looking temple for me. Woo! Yeah, that's great. But what's the real priority that you should have in your life? I hope that it revolves around honoring God living for him, having a transformed life, loving your neighbor as yourself. These sorts of issues. You know, these are the issues that we struggle on. It's real easy to build a really great looking temple. I mean, you could hire a million craftsmen to do that. They're probably a dime a dozen. But to find somebody whose life truly reflects the priority that they place on Jesus Christ. Now that is tough to find. And as Stephen is telling this to the high priest, to the council, do you think it's beginning to set in? That the priority that we need to have in this life doesn't revolve around all of these external issues. These guys were so weighty on these external issues that they completely lost sight of what the priority ought to be for all of them. They were so focused on making sure we kept every last little part of every last little law to the point that it became so cumbersome and so not helpful. Well, they did it anyway, though, because that's what was important. They lost sight of what the true priority was. And my challenge to you in this is don't lose sight of what the real priority is in life. We have a lot of priorities for sure. And just because we have good priorities, well, I mean, that's okay. I mean, I'd like to have a good job. I'd like to have a great family. I'd like to make some money. I'd like to have a nice Christmas. There's a lot of things that are good priorities. I'd like to have a house that works. It's a wonderful priority to have a dwelling place that you love, family that you care for and admire. These are wonderful priorities. But do they come at the expense of your walk with the Lord? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Oftentimes we'll prioritize a good job over our walk with the Lord. We'll prioritize friendships over our walk with the Lord. And we begin to make excuses. 
yeah, but these these three guys, they've, they've been with me for a long time. I know we go out and get drunk at the bar, but still, they're my friends. Are they? Where's your priority at? You seem to be prioritizing these three fellows pretty highly, but what about your walk with the Lord? Where's your priority on that? Are you doing things that demonstrate that a walk with the Lord is your top priority? Are you going to continue to love people even when you get dogged on? These are tough issues. These are very tough issues. Joshua continues. David continues. David wants to build this temple and his priority is in the wrong place. And God's got to straighten him out. You remember, this is probably my favorite story in all the Bible. When David wants to build God a temple, he says to Nathan, I want to build God a temple. And Nathan says, go do all that is in your heart. So David goes to bed and Nathan gets a visit from God. Nathan's told, you got to tell David he's not building the temple. Priorities in the wrong place. I appreciate the offer. I think this is a wonderful thing that you want to do this, but the priorities in the wrong place. We've got to have number one be number one. A lot of times, this is what I, one of the things that I like to say is, a lot of times we like to major on the minors. David was majoring on the minors. Children of Israel were majoring on the minors. Our priorities in the wrong place. And oftentimes we too can start to major on the minors. We tend to think of everything else as more important than God. What are you going to do to demonstrate that God is your number one priority? Not saying it's easy, but very few things about Christianity is easy. But it is necessary. A good solid walk with the Lord can be challenging. That's true. But that doesn't mean you get to walk away. That doesn't mean you get to forsake it. That doesn't mean you don't have to come to church anymore. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. It just means you need to buckle down and get serious. Where is your priority? And God and David had to have it out one day about where is your priority? Is your priority to build me a luxurious temple, David? Or is your priority to do what I tell you to do, not do what you just want to do? And in spite of how awesome it is, you, David, need to do what I want you to do. What is it that God wants you to be doing? God had to straighten David out. Because what is it that God wanted David to do? God wanted David to go subdue the enemy. He wanted to expand the territory. That's what David's job was. Not temple building. It's as if to say, you know, God, I'm not sure if you thought about this temple thing yet or not. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for you. And God says, David, don't worry about that. Do what I want you to do. So what is God wanting you to do? What do you think God was wanting these chief priests in this council to do? Get in Stephen's way? What, did, what was God's plan for them? And so we have to have this straightened out. And you know, when you start to straighten people out, when you start to tell them what God wants from them, and you know, I'm not so sure that he wants you to be doing this, but I actually think he wants you to be doing that. And when people don't like to hear that, but sometimes they don't because they think they're not wrong. You ever try to straighten somebody out and then they're just never wrong? You ever talk to these people? They're just never wrong. You can tell them to your blue in the face that you need to be at church. You need to be reading your Bible. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. And they just don't think that they're wrong and they think that you're kind of dumb. All, you know what ends up happening? Persecution. Which is the third element this morning, the sixth in total for his message Verses 51 through 53. God just gets done saying previously, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? Or what place is my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? I don't need anything from you guys. Get your priorities straight. And you know, when you start to get your priorities straight and other people are starting to see it, Stephen's now going to call these people out. He's going to, all of a sudden, the cards are going to get put on the table. He's going to be done beating around the bush here in verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears. So tomorrow, when somebody's giving you a hard time, 
you need something to call them, a biblical, a biblical threat, is he threatening them? Is he calling them names here? But something biblical to say would be you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears. Stephen just lets them have it. No more beating around the bush. No more innuendo. No more guessing. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. And he just got done walking them through how their fathers were disrespectful, were not prioritizing correctly, causing all kinds of problems in spite of how God set it all up for them so that they just had to walk through it via the promises, the patriarchs, these sorts of things, give Moses, whatever, the Ten Commandments. We All you had to do was just walk in line, guys, for whatever reason. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. Wow. Let them have it. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Kind of a rhetorical question. As we know, most of the prophets were killed. Not all of them, but a lot of them were. It was not, uh, it was not the most healthy profession to be a prophet. Ezekiel's wife is just killed just like that by God to prove a point. It was rough to be a prophet in those days. Tradition tells us that Isaiah was sawed in half. It was tough to be a prophet in those days, guys. The persecution was horrendous. Martyrdom, constant. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? As if to say, you guys just couldn't leave well enough alone. You always had to be causing problems. You couldn't figure out your priority. And as a result, you were persecuting everybody that came along that was trying to help you. And they killed those who foretold of the coming one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. It's not bad enough that you guys and your forefathers were killing the prophets and making things difficult and causing all kinds of problems. But now... As a result of this lineage of awfulness, y'all just done killed the Messiah too while you were at it. So why does he give a history of Israel as his defense? As if to say, this whole time, I could have seen this one coming. You guys have been killing the prophets this whole time. You guys have had everything laid out for you and you just can't keep yourselves from causing problems and having missed priorities and your persecution is crazy. And now guess where we're at? You're persecuting me. Big surprise. And you shouldn't have been doing it then. You shouldn't be doing it now. But here we are. You're persecuting me, just like your forefathers were persecuting them. Can we please stop this cycle? Your last big mistake was to kill the Messiah. Can we please be done with this cycle? Can we just repent and get ourselves right with God? How about we do that? Why does he give a history of Israel for his defense? He's trying to straighten them out. He's trying to help them see what God has been trying to do with them this whole time for centuries. What God has been trying to do to them, with them, for them. They didn't see it then, wouldn't see it then. Will they see it now? He's got one last shot before they kill him. Cat out of the bag, he does die. One last shot to straighten him out. One more time, he's going to give him this history to help straighten him out. How does he do, guys? About as good as any of them ever did. And they're going to kill him too. And they killed those who foretold the coming one, the just one, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers, who have received by who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. You have been given everything you need to make wise and good decisions today. 
everything. You've been given the law. You've been given prophets. You've got scripture. Because remember at this time, there's no New Testament, you guys, right? Remember you run on this? There's no New Testament yet. But what they did have, the law, the prophets, the scriptures, and he reminds them, you have everything you need to make all the right decisions here. You know this history. You know what has happened in the past. And you know that Jesus is the Christ. So what are you going to do? No, I'm asking, what are you going to do? You know the prophets. You know the scriptures. And you know the law. And you know that Jesus is the Christ. What are you going to do? It's as if Stephen could preach this very same message to any church in America today. You know all the right answers. This history has not changed. Don't be like that guy from my opening illustration and, and just think that if you just read it a second time, maybe it'll be different. Maybe you'll come to a different conclusion. No, the conclusion is the same. Whether it's six o'clock news or 10 o'clock news, Jesus is still the king. Jesus is still the Messiah. Stop trying to look for something else or figure it out or make some excuse about somehow you don't have to do this or answer to this. You have to answer to God in the end and he's told you exactly what you need to do. So stop making the excuses. Stop causing the problems and start making the right priority the right priority. Stop majoring on the minors and do what it is that God wants you to do and stop getting in the way of what he's trying to do through you. He wants you to accept Jesus as the Christ. He wants you to repent of your sins. He wants you to get right with him. And he's given you everything you need to do that. The only thing stopping you from doing that is you. If you would just believe. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. You could be forgiven of all the sins that so easily ensnare you. If you would just believe. Repent of those sins that put Jesus on the cross. I bet Stephen was preaching hard to these guys. Oh, he's probably letting them have it. We're going to find out next week the result. I already told you the result, but we'll go through it next week in a little bit more detail. What happens to Stephen? And what happens to us when we try to share this message with people? We might not get killed, but it's, it's not easy being a Christian. But it is necessary if you want to have forgiveness. Let's pray.